Good evening, everyone. Hello, thank you for joining us tonight. This is a great crowd uh, for a wonderful program. I'm Amanda Hunt, Director of Education and Public Programs here at the museum. And I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists for this evening. Lauren Halsey's exhibition, We Still Hear There, is on view upstairs. And this is the occasion for tonight's conversation. Uh, Seku Cook will moderate and lead the discussion. Um, and I will just briefly move into everyone's bios before I hand the floor off to our wonderful people in conversation tonight. So I'll start with Lauren Halsey herself, uh, who lives and works here in LA. Um, her work is on view, of course, upstairs at MOCA, but as well at the Hammer for the Made in LA 2018 Biennial. It's been a very good and busy year for our good friend. Um, her work upstairs, the installation, is site-specific, and it celebrates South Central Los Angeles, where Lauren has lived since childhood. Um, and the installation, which I hope you'll all see if you haven't, uh, embeds neighborhoods, textures, artifacts, and the architecture into its very landscape in our museum. Uh, Halsey earned her MFA from Yale University. She holds a BFA from California Institute of the Arts, and she participated in the architecture program in El Camino College in Torrance. Amanda Williams is a visual artist, also trained as an architect. Her practice blurs the distinction between art and architecture through works that employ color as a way to draw attention to the political complexities of race, place, and value in our cities. Williams has exhibited widely, including the recent Venice Architecture Biennale in 2018, a solo exhibition at the MCA Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, and the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis. She served as a visiting assistant professor of architecture at Cornell University and Washington University in St. Louis. She lives and works on Chicago's South Side. Open Mike Eagle is a Chicago-born, LA-based rapper and entertainer whose background as a lyricist uh, and his own upbringing in public housing lends a thoughtful perspective on black spaces. Uh, Eagle's latest album, Brick Body Kids Still Dr Daydream, launched a worldwide tour in 2017 that included opening spots for ASAP Rock and Y, as well as multiple US headlining shows and a live performance on Tiny Desk. The New Negroes, a live comedy show created by Eagle and actor-comedian Baron Vaughn, has performed uh, across LA and was recently picked up by Comedy Central. And finally, last but not least, our wonderful moder moderator, Sekou Cook, who is currently assistant professor at Syracuse University School of Architecture, where his current research centers on the emergent field of hip hop architecture, which he will tell you all about this evening, so I'm not going to. Um, this work will be the central focus of an upcoming exhibition entitled Close to the Edge, The Birth of Hip Hop Architecture, which will open in October at the AIANY Center for Architecture. Cook holds a BARC from Cornell University, a master's in architecture from Harvard University, and is licensed to practice architecture in New York and California. Please join me in welcoming everyone to the stage. I welcome everyone. Thanks for all coming out. And um, it's really great for me to be back in LA. The last time I was here was probably 2010, about eight years ago. And uh, I'm at the Standard in downtown, and everything's different now. <laughs> Um, you know, and uh, I just saw the Broad earlier today, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, and I'm really happy to be here at the MOCA and be back at the MOCA. I've been here before, um, and I'm thankful again for Lauren introducing um, me to the show that she's putting on here and getting me involved in um, all the amazing work that she's doing. So thanks, Amanda, thanks, Lauren, and thanks, Karen, for organizing some of the logistics uh, over the last few weeks, um, and to the rest of the panel, Amanda Williams and Open Mike Eagle. Um, so I'll open with a, a brief kind of um, lay the land, the basic ideas behind hip hop architecture, what I've been working on for the last uh, four and a half years now and um, where it's going, what, what, what we're working on, um, and then I'll quickly introduce the panel. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I'll try to keep this to about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, and, and I have to bite my tongue sometimes because each of these ideas that I, that I drop has like another kind of tunnel or chasm that it can go into. So I'll try to avoid those and save it for the conversation afterwards. Um, 
All right, so introduction. So, um, so as I said, a quick introduction to the topic, starting with how I got involved, how this, this became something that I wanted to pursue. And as we all know now, everything begins and ends with Kanye. So, um, so Kanye, uh, this is the first piece that I wrote that had anything to do with hip hop. Um, and it was, uh, I was fortunate to get it published on Art Daily. Um, and at the, at the moment, it was right after he had uh, started to say some things in the public realm about architecture, about how he meets with five architects at a time. And the, the response within the architecture community, the first response was, um, Kanye has no place talking about architecture. He doesn't know anything about the industry. He's not trained. Um, and, and my argument was that uh, Kanye talking about architecture is good for architecture because it has this terrible history of underrepresentation. If none of you know right now, um, architects represent less than 2% or black. Um, less than 2% of all registered architects in this country uh, identify as black. Um, that includes just over 300 of them who identify both as black and as women. Um, I know half of them. Um, uh, one of them's my sister. Um, so, uh, what, what I said, so what I say in this piece is that um, what gets me most excited is the vision of a whole new generation of kids personally inspired to explore all aspects of their creativity who have discovered the unlimited potentials of the architectural discipline because they listened to something Kanye West said with passion and conviction. And so that led to this moment. Um, conveniently, while I was at the GSD, um, Kanye came and it became a whole kind of uh, 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 you know, PR buzz thing that, that, that the school used and that um, quite a lot of people use in, in this moment. Um, and, and then he, it, when he was here, he actually met with a few of us and talked about, um, and we, we were talking to him about the potential of using this moment to, to do something bigger. Um, and that's when I was reminded of the, all the conversations I used to have with my uh, colleagues at, at Cornell in the mid-90s about hip hop architecture and what that was about. Um, so that led me to write this, um, uh, this piece, The Fifth Pillar, a case for hip hop architecture that was part of the, uh, in, in 2014, published in the Harvard Journal of African American Public Policy, um, that then later led me to other works um, that were on the same topic. So Roughneck Constructivism, a great show by Kara Walker. Um, I just saw some of her work across the street in, in the Broad, it's really amazing. Um, and the exhibition catalog from this had additional essays by Craig Wilkins, who I was later introduced to. Uh, I was later introduced to this book, The Aesthetics of Equity, that was written in 2007. And um, this is the first major publication that mentions hip hop architecture and men talks about it as a way of rethinking urban spaces and that it's an essential, it's gonna be an essential tool for um, urban designers going forward. So that led to 2015, um, where I hosted, um, I organized and hosted the first symposium on the topic at Syracuse University. Um, Amanda Williams participated, um, and we had it at Slocum Hall. Um, and it was, it was two days, it was 12 people, it was quite involved, um, and it had a typical format of presentations from a podium and panel conversations. But we also had these events in the middle of the atrium where we, they were kind of ciphers, we took over the, the, the public space of the school and just had this uh, provocation sessions, I call them, and uh, just had this conversation about, about all these different things. And this were, these, to me, were, the, the, were just like the most fun part of the whole um, event. Um, and then, of course, coming back to Kanye now, um, I told you it all begins and ends with Kanye. Um, so this is the most recent piece that I've published. Um, and this is the, the, you know, the first piece was keep talking, this one was stop talking. Um, and and uh, the central thesis of this one is that, that there was no real follow through with that initial promise from five years before. Um, you know, and, and that most of the things that he'd been doing in the, in, in the interim are really quite self-serving and not really community-based or community-focused. The, the kind of basis, the kind of uh, uh, um, script that we have written for what hip-hop architecture could be. Um, and, and just making the point that, that Kanye practicing architecture does not equal hip-hop architecture, right? So if he 
if he says that he's going to open an architecture firm, that's not exactly what we're talking about here. So um, I'll, 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 again, I'll drop a few little nuggets of theory here. Um, I don't want to get overly academic. I don't want this to drone on too long. Um, but these are important important aspects of, of the conversation for us to um, ground all of what we're talking about today. And um, maybe we'll dig deeper into some of these ideas as we go forward. Um, and it's important to, to give it a, a kind of real academic um, theoretical foundation that it can stand on so that it can last the test of time. So it's not just this fad, it's not just this thing that is a provocation that people use to, to get um, PR, right? Um, so the, the two, there, there are two kind of fundamental pieces of the hip hop architecture theory that I, that I um, talk about quite a bit. The first is uh, it's hard to talk about hip hop without talking about its architecturally specific origins, that it came out of a very specific kind of space, right? It came out of uh, public housing, public schools, public prisons, and they all kind of share the same kind of, uh, the same, uh, uh, spatial dynamics, the space, same material, the, spa the same grid. And um, I, I presented a, a piece in, in March at the Denver ACSA conference about the oppressive grid um, and, and how every time uh, black bodies in this country have, have met the grid, it has been a, a symbol of oppression and not this neutral this neutral device for organizing architectural spaces. So in that, I write, from the moment blacks were packed in onto slave ships, they were met with prevalent systems of neutrality, order, and efficiency. They rebelled. Later, housed in tightly confined slave quarters and shotgun houses, they rebelled. More recently, relegated to public housing, public schools, and private, pr and private prisons, each with spatial logistics and security features, bars on windows, chain link fences, etc., exemplifying hyper rationality and utility, they rebelled. So the second part of, of hip hop architecture theory that I, I'd like to highlight is um, the missing architectural expression within the hip hop cultural movement. So if you think about hip hop as, as a larger cultural movement, and I would argue the dominant cultural movement of our, of our time, um, uh, you have to align it with the other kind of cultural movements of, of the, the recent past. Um, so in the, in the first piece, in the case for hip hop architecture, the fifth pillar piece, I write um, each major cultural era in Western society, the Renaissance, the Baroque, modernism, enlisted a plurality of creative outlets, theater, music, dance, fine art, and architecture. The first four art forms find their counterparts in the four pillars of hip hop, DJing, MCing, b-boying, and graffiti writing. Architecture is lost. So a couple other, a few other quick points in the, the kind of theory section. Um, so, uh, so this is from Kara Walker's Roughneck Constructivism, and this philosophy kind of guides a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last few years. Um, and interestingly enough for me, the, the show was a, a show of visual artists, but she's proposing a theory of architecture. And I found that in incredibly fascinating, and that was rooted in hip hop. Right, so, um, and, and I think that hip hop architecture is that movement that she's in search for. Um, the second piece, I, I quoted this in the, the piece I wrote about the oppressive grid, and this is Emmanuel, Emmanuel Judice talking about postmodernism. And there was this debate between the whites and the grays, and she was talking about how this is, uh, um, they're, they're promoting a discipline that's devoid of identity. And, and that's incredibly problematic, especially from a hip hop point of view, which is all about identity. Um, so why would you want to take identity out of architecture? Um, and of course, at our, at, our, um, at our symposium, Amanda Williams was, you know, picked up on this and said, you know, uh, every time she heard about the whites and the grays, it was almost as if, as, as if they, they didn't think about uh, blacks, like black is somehow left out. And she went on to, to, to um, suggest who those blacks might be. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, you'll have to watch the videos at some point. Um, and then the, the last piece, um, this is actually um, 
it's kind of a testament of how vulnerable I try to make myself in these presentations. Um, this is actually something that I, I, I just wrote last night. I thought about it last night, wrote in a notebook. I was reading Tanahisi Coates, um, and uh, and I was thinking about us, this constant search for black architecture um, that that that's been happening for at least the last forty five years since the inception of Noma, and and what I'm pr proposing here is that we don't really have to go. Um, that it's not necessary for us to go all the way back to Africa or look at some of the early um, 20th century black practitioners who have been really successful. Um, people locally here, Paul Revere Williams did some amazing work here in LA, um, but that there's already an architecture that has been brewing in the bellies of hip hop kids for over 40 years. It is already authentically black and American and it aches to be expressed and recognized. This, I think, is uh, a guiding principle of what hip hop architecture is. So um, the second question I get when I say hip hop architecture, well, the first question is, what is it? And I think I kind of briefly talked about what it might be. But the second question is always, what does it look like, right? So uh, I've been lucky enough to, to be um, given the opportunity to do a, 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 um, an exhibition at the Center for Architecture in New York that Amanda was, was mentioning. Um, so I'm curating and designing this exhibition. It's gonna open in October and run through January. Um, and, and this is really about the project of what does it look like? Who's been doing it? Who's been practicing it? What might it look like? Can we have a larger conversation about it? Um, and so it, it, it will include work from Amanda and from Lauren. Um, we'll have to get Mike involved somehow in some of the conversations, some of the um, panel discussions. Um, but there's uh, amazing work that's gonna be in it. Um, some, some work from, from Lekan Jafus, who to me is doing some of the most amazing um, digital visualizations that could um, exemplify what, what hip hop architecture might be. He's heavily influenced by hip hop. He's, he's just like Amanda, trained as an architect, uh, practicing as a visual artist. Um, some of the, the, the worlds that he imagines are, are really quite remarkable. Um, work from Delta, who's uh, a pioneering um, European graffiti artist from the early 80s, who's now doing uh, large scale architectural installations. Um, so he's moved from the 2D surface into this 3D realm. Um, he's done some quite amazing pieces. Um, he's actually um, uh, uh, been collaborating with architects to do pieces like this. Um, this is actually what public housing looks like in, in the Netherlands, by the way. Um, and, uh, and then work from others like uh, James Garrett Jr., who uh, lives and works in St. Paul, Minnesota, and has been developing his own theory about hip hop architecture, and has been very vocal about, about it to me, <laughs> among others. Um, and, some, and then some student work, um, going back to the, to the mid and early 90s at Cornell. This is Nina Cook John, um, one of the black female architects I was mentioning earlier. Um, and uh, you know, this is a, this is a project where, she, this is her thesis, where she was looking at these leftover spaces in the Bronx and Queens that could be used as public amenities for the, 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 Caribbean, pop, the Caribbean populations there. Um, and then some, some more current student work. Um, so now the people who were just talking about this stuff in the early 90s, they're now professors and they're, they're, they're running studios about this. So there's gonna be work in the show from the University of Cincinnati, um, work from Stephen Slaughter's studio, work from Chris Cornelius' studio at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, and then some work from my own students at Syracuse University. So um, this is some uh, early diagramming of, of uh, DJ process and how that can be applied to an urban strategy. And this project was in DC. Um, there are a couple of these books that are outside um, documenting some of this work. Um, and uh, seeing how it can actually become an urban strategy that also has the power to, to reveal and uncover histories here. It's tracking some of the historical um, uh, spaces that used to be present in the Southwest, wa Southwest Waterfront District before they leveled it and put up this, these IMPE towers. Um, and then 
turning that in now into um, public spaces that can be used um, in, in a quite a different way. And uh, it will include a little bit of my own um, recent design explorations into this field. Um, so this is a, a, a series that I was doing about um, uh, about using DJ technologies, scratching, mixing, crossfading techniques as a way to uh, performatively dismantle and demolish buildings that are slated for demolition on the south side of Syracuse. Um, and so uh, the, the images that are, the, the surfaces that are now created by these slips creates, create um, places for new images of the neighborhood's past. Uh, so the design of the show itself, I'll talk about really briefly. Um, if you know the space, it's it's a it's a, uh, a storefront space. It has a pretty great glass vitrine in the front, um, and the the first idea is just to put a big shipping container in the middle. Um, the shipping container is something that came up quite a bit in a lot of the the, the work that's being exhibited, um, and so now it becomes the surface that is the exhibition surface instead of the wall surface. Um, so it gets cut up, broken up, hung on the walls, and instead of, of painting the gallery walls, uh, single color will have a, a, a graffiti crew come in and actually tag and, and put murals on the walls. Um, and here I'm gonna be debuting a couple, a couple images that I haven't shown anyone yet, so again, making myself Vulnerable. Um, so uh, this is what some of the interior of the spaces uh, are, are hopefully going to look like um, uh, if, if the plan goes all the way through. Hopefully, hopefully it won't change too much from, from what we're planning here. All right. So now I'm going to introduce the panel and we can talk about some of this quite a bit more. Um, uh, Amanda gave, gave the kind of bare bones detailed uh, introductions, so I'll make these a little bit more personal. So um, Lauren, uh, I taught her architecture. I was her last architecture professor at CCA. Um, and uh, unlike others who have told maybe try something else. Um, she actually thanks me for, for doing that because it led her down the path that she's, doing, she's on right now. Um, she's, uh, interestingly enough, taught by both myself and by Amanda, Amanda Williams, at, while we were at CCA. Um, and uh, that led her to her, her amazing career now where she got her MFA at Yale. And of course, she's the main reason we're all here. So uh, this current path started with her um, you know, doing these large-scale installations. The Kingdom Splurge series had a few different iterations. And um, I'm really fascinated by this, these constantly changing environments. I think it speaks quite a lot about, about hip hop spaces, especially graffiti kind of spaces, um, and the culturally specific images that are layered on top of that. And it, there's this kind of new kind of placemaking um, that's happening here. Um, later in iterations of the same projects are shown here. Um, this is from an installation at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And now the, the imagery gets embossed within the wall tiles that are, are prototyped for a, a newer project that's, that's happening. This is a project that's planned for um, the, the Crenshaw District that's um, going to be a permanent installation to be built next year. Um, and it's called Crenshaw District Hieroglyphics Project, and you know, ex expanding on those same techniques. I think this collage itself is quite quite fascinating. And as Amanda said, on view right now is kind of a prototype of this um, at the Hammer Museum in in LA, um, here in LA. Um, and I think some of these pieces are are wonderful. If I, if 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 maybe I'll have time early tomorrow morning to go to go check it out. Um, so and and then of course. Uh, I'm sure you've all had a chance to walk through um, the, 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 sh the, the piece upstairs. Um, and it's, it's you know, they're, they're, it, it just feels like the kind of space that we would create if we had zero references, zero Western references of, of space making or architecture, which is really, really um, amazing. So I'm very excited to have her as part of the conversation. I'm just gonna play a really, short clip um, before I ask her to come up on stage. Just with LA, but also everywhere, and the composition of neighborhoods, of bodies, of 
you know, whole community identities being shifted because of larger machines, thinking about uh, architecture not being outside the conversation of other forms of repression. Please welcome Lauren Halsey. So um, Amanda and I have known each other since 1993 when I first came to visit Cornell and um, I was about 15 years old I think um, and uh, and we've known each other ever since and she's been um, she's actually heavily influenced um, my journey through this whole hip-hop architecture realm. Um, she's actually pushed me quite a lot. She's been a mentor, a counselor, um, and she's actually, uh, in her own work, she uses a lot of hip-hop culture and techniques and um, often cites rap lyrics as the titles are embedded within some of her paintings. And she's the one who titled this, this panel and uh, helped me with some of my other titles as well. Um, uh, her, her, her her most well-known work is the Colored Theory um, series, uh, which are really amazing if you don't know anything about them. This is where uh, she has taken these uh, buildings that are slated for demolition across the South Side or Inglewood in Chicago and just took it upon herself to paint them one solid color. Um, and, and make them a kind of prominent piece in the neighborhood and gave them these very uh, culturally specific um, names like pil this one is called Pink Oil Moisturizer um, and then Ultra Sheen Blue. Um, so, and, and then that kind of leveraged her into doing it, uh, winning the Pulitzer Arts Foundation Award in 2017 where she was able to work with, with Andres Hernandez on this project, uh, A Way Away. Um, it's about marking territory now and documenting the whole demolition process of this building that they painted, keeping all the materials, repurposing the materials, and then re-showing the materials um, at, the, at the MCA show. Uh, really uh, amazing uh, within uh, uh, this conversation about marking territory and erasure. Then I'll play a, a quick clip. The exhibition starts at the scale of The Citizen. That's a work by Amanda Williams and Andres Hernandez in collaboration with the artist Shawnee Crow. Their work is an exploration of the African-American experience through materiality and enclosure. And for me, the work is incredibly powerful because it deals with a, a fugitivity. It talks about the people in the U.S. and globally who actually don't have access to the rights and privileges of citizenship and the kind of survival tactics it took for them to survive. So the piece is inspired by the kind of lives of Harriet Tubman and Harriet Jacobs. But additionally, it takes another pivot, right? It talks about how we might not just survive, but also thrive, and the kind of rich interiority that one has to construct, um, even in contexts where one doesn't have the kind of rights of our peers. Please welcome Amanda Williams. So, so Open Mic Eagle, as Amanda mentioned, is, is Chicago born and bred, just like Amanda Williams. Um, he now lives in LA. Um, and uh, he'll, uh, one thing Amanda forgot to mention, that he'll be playing uh, at the Pitchfork Music Festival this summer in Chicago. Um, the, the, the Brick Body Kids Still Daydream album is really quite um, amazing if we're talking about it within this context. Um, even the, the cover art here that's, that's done by uh, McKay Felt where you kind of get this, this sense that the, the buildings themselves represent the body of the people who, who occupied them. Um, and there's a, a great quote from, from Rodney Carmichael from NPR Music that says, uh, rappers have rhymed about housing projects since hip hop's beginning. When it comes to the politics of place, there is no home base more synonymous with the birth of the genre. For the better half of the 20th century, these brick, brick monstrosities served as warehouses of poverty and inequality in urban centers throughout the country. Hip hop provided a voice for an another wise forgotten demographic. On Brick Body Complex, Open Mic Eagle fuses the source and its voice 
literally becoming the building as he delivers a defiant blues. And then I'll give you a little taste of, of one of the tracks from that. A rapper, my motherfucking name is Michael Eagle I'm sovereign, I'm from a line of ghetto superheroes I holler, I got something to bring to your attention Attention, 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 attention I promise you I will never fit in your descriptions I'm giant, don't let nobody tell you nothing different They lying, a giant in my body is a building A building, a building, a building Please welcome Open Mike Eagle. All right, cool. Um, so I'll, I'll start with, with, with Lauren. So um, again, I, I, I famously told you that, that maybe you should try doing something else other than <laughs> architecture. But it seems that, that architecture is still something that's very, very important in your work. I want to get at the bottom of, of why uh, architecture kind of never left your system, why it's such an int integral part of your work. Yeah, I think uh, just growing up in LA as a little girl who uh, you know, never went to school in my neighborhood, I went to a Montessori school in Westchester and uh, you know, driving down Manchester, which is you know, this long avenue to get there and back home, I quickly had emotional an emotional response to just architecture. And I knew like, you know, very, you know, quickly via these like architectural boundaries, these uh, new spaces where I was, and that would denote class, that would denote race, that would mean that I couldn't just walk outside, that would mean I need a whole crew of people. And I always thought, and I still do of architecture and building your own uh, spaces as a solution to that sort of like, you know, mess. So um, did you have a sense that immediately that I can, I can take over uh, agency over that? Like I'm Totally, my parents to gave me a lot of freedom. Like they didn't tell me no. <laughs> And so my bedrooms were really wild. And so, um, or my bedroom was really wild. And so the guys, my very best friends who live on my street still, or whose you know, parents uh, still live there, and we built what's upstairs, and they helped me build the Hammer Museum. Um, you know, also helped me just like, you know, build out my room and remix it over and over and over and over and over again. And I think that just gave me like the guts and the audacity to you know, sign up for architecture at El Camino. So, so um, Amanda, you you've had a kind of, or we've ended up at a kind of similar place to Lauren right now, but you had a much different trajectory. Like you went through five years of architecture school, got got the degree, worked in architecture for a, a, a number of years. You still teach architecture now. Um, how, you know, um, and, and one of the things that's, that's fascinating to me, I, I constantly tell my students this story of how you decided to, to just quit your job, your architecture job, and go after your passion, and do and go practice painting. So, um, but now you're doing this work that's, that's um, architecturally engaged, uh, is being recognized by architects in many different ways, even though they may not call it capital A architecture. Um, how, how important do you think that is for uh, a profession that's always trying to like keep itself so grounded in the center? Um, how important do you think your work is specifically to this larger conversation of what architecture is today? Um, I don't. I don't think I thought about it like that. I mean, I. It, you know, we're, we're in the midst of it too. So the coach you had about aching, it's like, it's not aching, we're just doing it. Like we don't have time to be bothered with whether or not it's relevant anymore. Um, and so it's just so interesting to listen to Lauren because I probably knew it, but I don't remember that you told her that. And I, I think I was the opposite. So I'm telling Lauren, stay in, you can do it. And as you just said that though, it was the moment that I, if I had, by the time I knew her, I had already quit my job, right? So. 
I had decided that this profession couldn't hold what I was trying to do while I was trying to encourage her to stay in so that she could break these boundaries, right? And so, and it was this kind of existential moment. She's like, what am I gonna do? Should I leave, should I not leave? And, and we kept in touch through email, but it's so ironic that you say that because I think we both ended up at the same moment um, when you don't have to use these, these kind of, and I don't know if they're Western definitions, but Western definitions of what you have to be, mm -hmm. but you just are who you are, right? And so I think at some point I wasn't interested or concerned with whether or not the profession accepted me or the art world accepted me. It's like, I don't have any choice, this is what I wanna do, so this is what I'm gonna do. I think the staying in was more about that pressure you feel, you know, at each stage that you've achieved these things at these sort of, you know, top brands of things, right? So Cornell and, and working in San Francisco and all these things, there's pressure to, to stay in that. And then that moment, actually because there was a surplus, I was telling some other students, they were like, there was a surplus in the economy? What are you, what are you saying? <laughs> so it was actually because it was like the pinnacle of, of whatever you could imagine. The Bay Area money was like water and they were making up projects and buildings and, you know, companies starting and you know pretend money and so at that pinnacle you know my boss was like well, well if you could be doing anything what would you be doing and I was like painting you know and then it it like shocked her right and so I think it was because of that that achieving everything you were supposed to have achieved and then realizing that that still wasn't enough as opposed to a deficit or not having it and so I think either leads to the same moment and I think the parallels in our stories are that evidence of that. It was the same driving down you know, streets in Chicago, the same kind of visceral reaction and this assumption that knowing architecture was a thing that would fix it, right? And so if we could just build it better, if the buildings were designed better, and then you get to architecture school and you're like, so Mises building on Lakeshore Drive is just like Cabrini Green? I don't understand. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. And then where's the class to tell me about it? And there wasn't one, right? And so I think, you know, those were the moments where you kind of, inside of it or outside of it, you're trying to make sense of how you're going to change that narrative. So, so Mike, you're from that same kind of location, right? You're from Chicago. You grew up in the Robert Taylor homes. Well, my uh, first cousin, auntie, uh, lived in I lived about a mile away from there in um, a building complex called Lake Meadows, which was similarly mm -hmm. uh, high rises, but it was designed differently. It's kind of difficult to explain how, but um, I spent a lot of time in the Robert Taylor homes, and so like that's part of my psychological identity, even though I didn't necessarily grow up there. Yeah. So but the that, architecture is actually the same, right? It's the so the buildings he's talking about yeah. is the same formal tradition. You, There's slight differences, right? In and honestly, the biggest difference might be that Lake Meadows was maintained. That's it. Yeah. That might yeah. be the biggest difference, yeah. There, there's um, this probably the, the least appropriate time to talk about this, but there's this terrible, terrible movie called Candyman. Oh, yeah. Um, That's a great that, movie. Uh, yeah. That it's, is a it's great movie, It's terrible, but it, it's about... <laughs> It's just a terrible horror movie, um, but it's, it's about, this, and they talk about the difference between Cabrini Green and this other, um, this other uh, development that's de developed by the same people at the same time, but one has black people in it and one has upper middle class white people in it, and it's just, you know. So, so wh why I brought that up is I, I'm really interested in, in what motivated you to make this album so much about buildings, like how, what, like how premeditated was that? How, when I started much? writing it, it was because I was, uh, I found myself impacted by, uh, like I had a memory of those buildings. And because those buildings got demolished while I was away in college, I wasn't able to have like, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to take that moment to process it when it happened. And so I was like on a flight somewhere like two years ago and I thought about it and I was like, I don't even know what's in that spot right now. Like I imagine that like there were these condos or some redevelopment or something that was there like in a lot of places where um, buildings like that got torn down. So I like researched it. Like I had the, the Wi-Fi on the plane and I was just looking it up and I was like, oh my God, there's nothing. Like there's nothing. Like these vast expanses of buildings that house like, you know, 30,000 people across like 12 buildings. They knocked all that down. There's nothing there. And like just the thought of that sort of erasure uh, really impacted me and made me want to like 
do like the audio equivalent of like a mural for what it was like to like live there. So, um, so I've, I've been doing two, two things the last few days. I've been, I've been reading Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me, and I've been listening to your album like a few different times, like, like three or four times. And um, what, what's really amazing about, I'm like halfway through the Coates book, and what's really amazing to me about that is him talking about the body, about the black body, as this thing that, that, that um, he bases his whole philosophy on. And uh, what, I, what I'm struck by is the constant references in, in your album to um, the buildings themselves representing this body that, you know, that we don't even have the power over, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that we don't have the power to shape the environments that we live in, we have the power to say whether it stays up or comes down, um, is just as bad as not having the power to walk down the, the street and not get harassed or... And I think the connection there is like this, this apathy from people outside of the community uh, to what happens. Um, so like the fact that there's a large amount of people in this country whose reaction when like a black person is murdered by the police, like their, like their first thought isn't like trauma or grief or mourning, it's like what did that person do? You know what I mean? And like there's, there's, there's a, a, a significant apathy there and I think it's connected to like how all those buildings could be knocked down and like they literally lost a third of those people. Like there's no record of them. And the fact that there's not, not like an outrage about that is kind of connected to this apathy. It's just like you imagine them as, it's, it's the, uh, the uh, othering thing. You imagine them as some community that's far away from you. Yeah. And so there's a... Uh, there's a, a lack of feeling that connectedness that would allow you to connect to people as humans. And I feel like that's the, the line, the parallel is, 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 is the apathy. So um, that, that will bring me back to something that I was thinking about for, for, for Lauren, where um, like the, the spaces that you're creating aren't just spaces that are constantly changing and evolving. There are spaces that are, are um, somehow created in a participatory manner, right? So there, there are all these people from your neighborhood, people from uh, people who you may or may not know that are now involved in the process of making and remaking these things. And, and, and given that agency, it's now they can care. Now they, they don't have the, the luxury of the apathy that, that Mike's talking about. They have, they're invested in that, that, that that um, project, and, and I'm thinking about that in parallel to um, the kind of typical architectural pro project, which is um, really hyper-controlled by one, either one person or one entity, and all of the questions have to be pre-answered before anything gets built, and then when it gets built, it's seen as this thing that has to be static. Um, and I wonder if, if you were making some of the same, those same kind of parallels in thinking about your process or in reading your work now, can you actually um, decipher some of those distinctions between the typical architectural process and the kind of process that you're, you're presenting right now? Yeah, and I think that's why like, I didn't go on to become an uh, architect because like I knew I wasn't interested in like those sort of systems or way of doing things and like I really struggled at that school and so um, when I started you know because I started making these uh, these like aspirational blueprints and I would make them you know on my best friends you know would be freestyling in my room they would you know be improvising like language and ideas I would be doing that with the collage and it would be like this beautiful synergy and then years later, a few years later, when it was time to you know actually build them, um, it made sense to use like hip hop. And so when I was like you know thinking about you randomly, like I was saying earlier, oh I wonder what Sekou Cook <laughs> is doing. And then I like YouTube you, and I see you at the Center for Architecture doing uh, this talk on hip hop architecture, and you were you know using the language of hip hop to describe processes that I was already using to describe what I was in. So the sampling, the remixing, the cipher, the freestyle building to, you know, think about a new way of like presenting new spatial paradigms or archetypes for, you know, uh, the human experience via space. 
And so, like, no, I've never, um, if anything, my favorite architects when I was at CCA it was Super Studio, the fantasy architects mm -hmm. whose architecture could never be built yeah. because they break way too many rules. So. So, but, so do you think any of that is actually possible or can, can we actually map out a path to an architecture that looks like that or works like that? Um, you know, because we can reference the, the, the super studios and the archigrams and, and people who live, or even Libius Woods, who people who lived in this kind of fantasy land and um, represented architecture in a very, very specific way to, to, um, to critique the, the, the way architecture was being produced. Um, but I, I'm constantly trying to answer the question of how can this be produced in reality? Is there a way, I mean, maybe Amanda can jump in on this as well. Do you think there is a way for people to, to actually create work that, that works in that way, that doesn't fall under any of the categories that we were taught in architecture school? Um, I think yes and no. So I think it goes back to a point you made about um, every, every moment in art or architectural history having these components that express themselves across these multiple disciplines. And then also a comment that, that Mike just made a second ago, which is this kind of apathy of, of the outside or the other. Um, I just want to acknowledge Mimi Zeiger's in the audience. So she's one of the curators for the Venice Biennale. And she invited Andres Hernandez and I, and we were like scratching our heads, right? We were like, so we're going to be the artists in the architecture Biennale talking about black people in architecture who don't really exist in architecture, right? So <laughs> the, the insistence by people that have the ability to force the discipline to have the conversation is when it will change, right? So clearly we're making the work. I mean, if you, you, know, if you look at Lake's work, Olele Kanjef is who he showed uh, briefly, I mean, we're doing the work and we have time to then write the codes and the whatever and the whatever, but actually we have the degree to do that, right? So there's this also this kind of like um, annoyance that we have to do everything, but we also know that black people always have to do everything. So we're one of the first generations that are like, yeah, we could, but we aren't. We're gonna do what we wanna do because we have the luxury to do that. So he's rapping and like, we're making art and you're teaching, right? But so there, it's possible, it's there, the work is there, the, the complexity of the work is there, the intellectual rigor is there, but I'm not gonna be the one that's also gonna then tell everybody how to do it the same way somebody found Mondrian and made modernism, right? So I think that it is possible. I think it's possible right now. I think the work you're doing is getting there. I think the work that the other practitioners are doing and where we can meet in the middle between these sort of like fantastical, full liberties we can take in contemporary art and to marry that with the building codes and the zoning boards and, the, yeah. <laughs> and all of this other stuff, that's when it comes together. Um, but it does take our colleagues now that exist in all those other spaces to write about it critically, to stand up for us when we don't feel like it, to go to the, be on the AIA whatever, not just the diversity panel, right? Like all of these other kind of components and I think that is the moment. But I do really want to say that we are in it. So it's also, I mean, what were those guys doing? What was, what was Mies doing running around propagating, you know, his manifestos and yeah. all these schools? Like, we're in that moment, right? So I don't, it's hard to say when or how it manifests itself. So, so maybe a lot of these underrepresentation numbers are actually skewed because maybe, because that's only measuring um, licensed architects. Mm -hmm. So because may, maybe there's this whole realm of black people who are really out there producing architecture but it's just not getting sanctioned as architecture. It's just not falling under this capital A that the AIA kind of controls. Well, I mean, we know like 50 of them right now we can name. So yes, so I mean, we, we know that. <laughs> and you're gonna write the book that tells well, us. Uh, the, the quest, so I was just about to pose the question, but I guess it's a question for myself. Like how do we show the work of these people? I guess that's, that's what I'm trying that's to your, do. That's your it's job. Not, I mean, it's, it sounds like part of the issue then is um, pointing out how important uh, the economic barrier of entry is mm. into entering into the sanctioned field. Because if that's constantly pointed to, then um, it might uh, give some space to give a real value to people who exist outside of that and, and are contributing awesome things creatively 
but um, you know, economically aren't able to you know, jump through the hoops you have to jump through to be seen as official. I mean, and, and interestingly enough, I think you know, that's, part of, that's part of what's interesting about hip hop and architecture, but it's also what can be dangerous because mm -hmm. there can be a fetish, fetishization oh, yeah. of hip hop elements mm -hmm. because uh, you know, through an academic lens, there's a distance. Uh, from from uh, art that's seen as rude or seen as uh, vibrant in that sort of way, so you know when you do introduce those elements, people can come in and and, and spray paint stuff, but then they have to leave. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so if there's some way to like point to, you know, that economic barrier being kind of BS, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And then that kind of can make the space to to give value to people who have to exist outside of that, but still have a lot to contribute. Yeah, I, th I think we're dealing with a lot of that fetishization already, right? Um, even in the brief, the brief moment that, that this, this, this conversation has been happening over the last few years, um, there's already a, a bit of fetishization about what, what this could look like or what it might be. Um, I've actually been, been resisting the question of what does it look like for um, several years now. Um, and, uh, and I think part of the... Uh, part of the, the um, the, what the show aspires to is to get to this thing that doesn't really look like anything, right? That you go through and you leave and feel like, oh yeah, I know what hip hop architecture is, but what does it look like? It's not one thing, right? It's, it's a group of people who are practicing in a way that I think Lauren is practicing and that I think Amanda is practicing in. So um, these are the things that I think are, are, are now really important. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I just, looked at, I just looked at my third question for Lauren, and this is the, the, the one that we just asked, right, about um, applying it directly to architecture. So what, what do you think is like the next evolution? Sorry? That's my children. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought someone was asking a question. <laughs> um, so, um, so what do you think is the next evolution of, of your work? Because I think there's a huge jump between, um, well, first doing your, your kind of master's thesis stuff to doing a, an ongoing installation here at the MoCA to then doing a permanent installation in, in, in Crenshaw, right? Um, what do you think is the next evolution of what you're doing? Is it gonna become and look more architectural? Is it it's actually gonna start challenging architects to think about things differently? Do you have very specific plans or are they kind of loosely evolving? Uh, both, I'm intrigued that like, you know, LA has like 12,000 empty lots, which is like wild. And so just like as a kid, you know, driving down or being a passenger down Western or even like an adult on the bus, I would uh, just sort of like hallucinate about these like space, these spaces and think about, you know, architectures of fun, of play, of leisure, of like remixed ancient Egypt. And so the way the, um, and this was just like a breakthrough where I'm like, oh, I can get through the back door, um, was I just emailed the senator and she didn't respond and then one of them, and then I emailed uh, the council member and he didn't respond. And then I emailed like everyone on his, like, you know, the public officials and I got two responses and it's just been two years of having these constant conversations of collaborating with my neighborhood to build a representational architecture, and they finally said yes. And so um, now my interest is art, and I see everything that I do in an art context, whether it's like you know, the garage or the backyard or here or at Hammer as an ex experimental uh, maquette for the, the real architecture to come. So my interest for the rest of my life is, um, you know, these FUBU architecture endeavors where I then work with like the LA Black Worker Center and because um, we're like 2% of unionized const uh, construction builders in LA with all this development and uh, financially affirm people that live within the neighborhood to build it so that it can be its own economy too. And then activate it with transcendent things, so it's just like this like nucleus of like, you know, feel good and aspiration and, and about us and for us. Wow, that, 
So that's the rest of <laughs> that, my life. That, I mean, that's, I'm glad I asked the question. It's just, I, I can't wait to see all that stuff happening. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm going to ask the same question to Amanda now. Like, and I'm going to say ditto, because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's exactly what you're going to do? You're uh, going to call? The south side of Chicago. I mean, literally, you know, this is so beautiful to see. Because literally, that's, that was my inspiration to become an architect. We have 14,000 vacant parcels in one neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, right? And so um, I, I, too, like, like this kind of um, artistic lens for trying to tackle these things and also make this kind of economic sustainability with it. The other piece that, that I'm also interested in, though, is all of the community groups and the organizers who are doing the stuff that don't get the newspaper article and the invitations and the whatever to now work to figure out um, how to use that visibility to infuse what they're already doing. So I think the, the coordinating of the organizing um, is something that's interesting in addition to that because I feel like a lot of times, you know, the people that are really on the ground doing a lot of the work will just give the thumbs up or be super excited but don't see what they are doing as some kind of um, design innovation or design thinking or any of those things. So how to do exactly what Lauren's talking about, but at the same time, um, get all of our independent efforts because we allow ourselves to, to accept these titles to really just fix the problem, right? Which is what we all wanna really do when it comes down to it. Um, and, and to be accepted for being able to use art to do that. Cause a lot, especially since I do have the degree, there's a lot of pressure to come, to come back. When are you coming back? When are you gonna, when are you gonna make a building again? Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, some article I said, you know, a million community centers would not make the impact on Chicago that I've made by painting a house yeah. pink oil moisturizer, right? <laughs> like the impact of that. Yeah. And somebody's like, it's not real, but it is real. And I could do that too, right? Like that all happens and it should happen in a community center that I could design with some wonderful floor plan. With but a budget. <laughs> with no budget. And, um, and have community input in a community a meeting. community process. Yeah, instead of everybody in Lauren's bedroom like repainting it over and over again, exactly. her parents are like, right on, right? Like that, <laughs> that's the agency. And so how do, we, how do we translate that so all these other people that are doing the work, the unions, the, the community organizers, you know, how do we help them see that as a kind of creative process as well? I think that's a, a power that we have that we also could be using. Interestingly enough, I'm also currently working on an open space project in in south side of Syracuse. Well, what um, city are do you, are want? you working on an <laughs> open can space? Can you pick a city so, for us? So, just... what are you working on? <laughs> what What are you working on next, Mike? A <laughs> television show. <laughs> okay, no, good. Oh, That's wait. every city. Oh yeah, just, yeah. just, just, just south side of television. your cable dial. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Talk um, talk to us about a bit more about the about the TV show. Uh, it's a, a live comedy show that uh, me and my co-host, who's an actor and comedian named Baron Vaughn, that we do in Hollywood. It's called The New Negroes. Um, and it's kind of like a space for us to show that like black comedy and, and black, you know, hip hop music, urban music is not just like monolithic. It's not just like one thing. Um, so in the television version, um, we have you know, three comics per episode and, and a collaborative song I've done with another artist. Uh, and, and all of it, uh, and the through line of each episode is like a conversation that me and a co-host are having on stage that like it tackles a certain topic. I mean, given we only end up with like four minutes to talk about it, we don't get to get deep, but it's like, you know, we get to be black men on TV talking about like, you know, self-care or like therapy or like how we don't know how to manage money and like, you know, like generational things that we haven't, seen a bunch of people talk about mm -hmm. um, and to provide a platform for people that look, act, speak all different kinds of ways but are really good at the craft of comedy and the craft of music to have like a space, you know, to be televised, you know. Great. Excellent. So um, I think we should open it up to the audience. I'm sure they've been, they've had a lot of questions brewing. I had a question for, uh, for, yeah. for, oh, sure. question yeah, for you for guys because as listening to you guys talk, there's there seems to be this, this um, constant struggle to 
have the expression, the improvisation of hip hop, but like you said, also having to adhere to municipal codes and the toilet's got to work and all, you know, like the stuff that you can't really change, you know, and everything does have to be planned out ahead of time and everybody has to agree. And um, is there any excitement in architecture for like what can be done like digitally or like virtually to like give some of that sensory freedom to a space, but not actually have to change any of the physical structure of it. Like if, in a, if a room could appear to change mm -hmm. in, in different ways, is, that, is there excitement there with, with the capabilities of what can happen technologically and where that meets architecture? I, I think there's a lot of excitement about that right now. Um, a lot of, not just excitement, but but uh, projects and funding and money <laughs> going towards projects that are developing, uh, was... especially things within VR right now, which seems to be VR and AR, which seem to be the, the next kind of hot button issue within, within architecture. But I would say um, it was, I'd say it's still, um, and I haven't been inside of Architecture Capital A in a long time, so I could be, anyone here that is can correct me. But it still seems like it's driven by the fact that there was a whole gaming movement or like the VR, like it comes from the technological side, it's not. So our friend Lake is making these virtual worlds and should be leading whatever this thing yeah. you're talking about, yeah. but he just wants to make these worlds he gets to, you know, escape to. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that the technology is what's really driving, right? So it's Samsung or LG or somebody that's driving this that then the profession jumps into as opposed to the profession having the capacity but not really generating that, right? We're still so, so I don't know what we're caught up in, but we're... The, the truth is that right? architecture is really slow. We're way behind everything constantly because we are, because the profession is so mired in its own sense of, of, of history. It's and, in its feelings. And it's... Um, it's it, in its feelings right now. It, it's, just, it's just like, it, it's, it's old. It's old and it's slow and it doesn't want to evolve. And, and I, I talk a lot about recently, actually in the last couple of years, I've been talking about the fact that um, uh, architecture doesn't want to be hip hop <laughs> and hip hop doesn't want to be architecture, right? Like they're, they're, they're morally opposed to each other. One wants to be constantly defining itself over and over again and improvisational and forward thinking. And as soon as you think you got it pinned down, it changes the rules of the game again. Um, and the other wants to recreate and redo the things that it's been doing well and do them a little bit better the next time around, right? And respond only when people get really, really angry or really, really, <laughs> um, uh, are really, really blown away by something for a long period of time, then architecture will say, okay, yeah, let's, let's get into that VR thing. Let's see what that can do for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. other, quest other questions? Please, well, should we wait for the mic? Uh, just kind of touching on what you guys were just speaking about, VR and AR. Um, and then also what you spoke about earlier, what does hip hop architecture look like? I don't think it really matters what it looks like. What it matters about is how you get there. Um, and all of the, the, um, the eras you were referring to before, uh, postmodern. I mean, that's a, that's an aesthetic, but I mean, it's it's the process of how I got there is how it created what it looks like. And what I'm going to say is, a uh, VR and AR is definitely used in architecture, but it's not necessarily used in in the pragmatic operating sense of the the building. It might be used in the process to get there, and that's up to the designer and the team or whoever is working on it to utilize in a smart manner. And then that creates the next step. So you might not see what the VR created, but it's it's there for the users to experience in the back end. So that's up to us to really push in terms of designers and knowing what our tools are, knowing that the DJ had a sample, had a, had a turntable, you know, the, the beat maker had a sampler, the 808, those are all elements that at the moment it's just a tool, but at the very end it's the signature for that, that era. So I think that's what you're seeing for the VR and the AR and any future technology that's coming through in terms of processing our spaces. Um, because I've been struggling with that too. How do I use this? How do I present this to my client? And what my tool is, I get to understand what I'm seeing in my mind immediately versus trying to 
produce renderings or, you know, talk them into something. I could just show them. I don't got to talk. I could just show them. And that's what that tool really helps do in execution. Um, anyway. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a space that, that um, we can innovate in really quickly and can lead, lead, lead the charge. As you're saying, Lake, again, Olale Khan Jafas, if you don't know who he is, you got to look him up. He's freaking amazing. Um, uh, he's way ahead of, in, in that game, and he's been doing um, VR things for, 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 for like a decade, right? Um, and uh, now, he, one of his most recent public, you know, published things are uh, experiential things, a whole kind of video landscape, a whole like um, uh, video narrative based on this graphic novel, and, and, it's, and it's amazing. Um, please. Do you want to wait for the mic to come? <laughs> Yes, Lauren, I wanted to know, like, more or less, what was the process you went through when you had this space to create the installation that you created? And um, was that the hammer or here? The oh, hammer. Yeah, the one upstairs. No, the one upstairs, yes. Yeah. Uh, the process. Um, I learned a lot of lessons from a residency that I did uh, like between 2014 and 2015 at the Studio Museum. And there was this moment where this sort of takeover happened with installation. And I sat down um, with like the chief curator of the museum and she said, uh, to create your context and to have your own autonomy in the way that you want to of building these like large spaces, you have to become an expert. You have to know, you can't just like be you know, in these art making processes and aestheticizing things, it has to be, well, the stud is here and this, this and that. Mm. So uh, when I was presented with this opportunity, I went straight to my cousin, who at the time was an architect around the corner at Perkins and Wills, and I gave them the floor, gave him the floor plan that Mocha gave me. And I said, well, these are the parameters. How many modular, you, you know, four by eights do I need to build to fill this room? And then what, what are, let's do how many four by fours. And so he set up the terms and that was as strict as it was. And then we took it to my grandmother's backyard and we just sort of funkified it. And we sort of freestyled these boulders in the sun. Um, mostly my girlfriend and my best friends and uh, my little cousins. And it was like this you know, collaborative effort of just like rubbing and caressing this like specialty concrete and then it ended up here and they installed it and then we like sort of finessed it for a week and a half to make it one seamless uh you know energy one form so that was it that is amazing I, I wish more architects would talk about funkifying their, their process, right? In their grandmother's backyard. Yeah, yeah, it's like I just put it in my grandma's backyard. That's, that's all I need to do. Other questions? Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, I'm really intrigued by all of the visualizations that, appeared, or that are going to appear in your forthcoming exhibition. And so I'm intrigued in like the kind of fusion between the auditory and the spatial. And I was wondering if you can speak to the kind of quality of rhythm, let's say, within hip hop architecture. Like back then, you know, in classical buildings, there's a kind of like the modulation of these different units, like columns, creates a kind of classical rhythm. And mm -hmm. while I was looking at all of these building facades, I was like, whoa, there's a kind of rhythm here, even if it is like at times or seemingly arrhythmic. I was wondering if you guys could speak about that, how, let's say, like, hip-hop rhythms are kind of visualized on an architectural scale. I'm going to, even though you're supposed to answer that, I'm going to be to pushy me. as usual. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you, you know, that's something that I have been um, uh, really directly thinking about and, um, and experimenting with and... Um, in, in an interesting way, I gave a couple, uh, a couple lectures um, a couple, uh, within the last year and a half where I have a little bit more time to talk about not just the work in general, but my own work. And I did this kind of um, auto-ethnography of all of the work that I had done for the last um, almost 20 years. 
and I could see, it was just like pulling out these patterns, these rhythms, these things that are almost grid-based, but kind of not based on the grid, just kind of shifting the grid a little bit, being a little bit off the grid, a little bit off kilter, and um, what I think that is, is just a, a, a bit of freestyling within that. Like, this is the structure. You gave me the structure, but I want to do something else. And there's this wonderful clip that, again, if I was doing a longer presentation, I would have shown. Um, it's, it's a clip talking about why Jay Dilla's um, Akai machine is in the Smithsonian Museum of Na you know, National African American History and Culture, right? Um, it's because he, he invented, he, um, he created a whole new way of creating beats using that machine. And um, the machine had this, this setting in it called quant quantization. And what quantization would do is if you're like doing a beat, it would like snap, if you're a little bit off, a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, it would actually snap it to the grid. Like it had this, this um, rhythmic grid and it would automatically recognize that and then kind of snap it to the grid so that your beats would sound like it's just, it, it would flow more regularly and consistently. And what, what Jay Dilla did is he turned off the quantization. And so now his beats are just much more, um, much more off kilter, much more uh, improvised and actually human, right? It humanized this, this machine. And I thought that was really, really fascinating. So to me, it's like this, this humanization of these orders that are, that are overly, you know, the classical orders have all these rules and all these mathematical logics. And they're so, uh, again, the word I have to use is oppressive. So um, I, I'm looking for a space where that can exist without this really rigid structure. I'm going to jump in and also um, channel my inner Andres L. Hernandez, my collaborator in Venice. Um, so he would argue that it's, it's, poly, it's polyrhythmic. And then I would say he'd also argue that, it, that this is that when it is sort of um, intuitive connections back to Africa. So we spent a lot of time, time making the piece for Venice talking about fractals. And so these very complex geometries. Um, that actually are, are in kente cloth, they're in um, jazz, they're in all these things. So he's, he's our music aficionado, but there's a way in which that kind of rhythm um, finds itself. So I'm again gonna keep arguing that Lauren's already doing that, right? So that process you just described for making the thing is our job to work backwards and go through your drawings and find the actual rhythm that might not be a grid at all. It'll be called something else, right? So. This is when the fight between the Western training and like our intuitive understandings don't, don't quite meet, right? Because it's already in the work. So we have to, we actually have to work backwards to get the draw, the plans or yeah. the drawings or I'm, the rhythms I'm, or the, you know what I mean? It's like yeah, I'm actually the, too far gone to actually work like that anymore. Like I, I can't, I can't betray my, my Cornell no, you have to. and Harvard training. You have right? to like, fight. Um, <laughs> you have to jump off the boat, fight. <laughs> Like, uh, like every every year mm -hmm. for thesis, I, I vote for the ones that are that has like the, the grid the and, there's it's, and there's some vellum and there's something crazy. painted on the back. Yeah. Um, but but what I can do, what I can do for my position that I've created for myself right now is be the interpreter, right? I can actually find the work that Lauren is doing and give it a stage and like interpret and and understand well, that's the why she's yeah. doing it, why she's doing what she's doing, because. Um, you know, I, I like to think that this stuff is just kind of happening without the premeditation of it happening. And then when we understand it, then we can teach it to others and then they can start there and then riff off of that and then it can, can become something else. I just want to toss out one, and I'll let you jump in. One project also to look at, and I don't know if, if Saku, if you've seen it, but um, Brian E. Roberts, at the first Chicago Architecture Biennial, did a piece with the South Shore Drill Team where they did a performance in uh, Federal Plaza, which was designed by Mies van der Rohe, and it's about breaking the grid. So this is, this is a Chicago kind of team, and they have this, um, these fake rifles, and they do this very precision drill team movements, and then it gets like footwork music like tossed into this like 
band performance and then they just like break free like the, the kids are trying to like stay in rhythm and then they just can't their bodies just take over and they like <laughs> break out of the grid and the the shooting of it is so beautiful because it shows you their feet on the line and they're so precise and then these moments where the music breaks in literally their bodies take over and they can't and so she right like she stuck that in there so that would be great for for you to take a look at and also you guys just to see yeah, to me, that, that is to that me, moment, sure. the potential of like understanding how, how to break out of the grid. Yeah. So uh, we'll take one more question. Sorry, right here. Um, and yeah, we have like a hard, they, they close this place at 8.30, so we got to get out of here. Real, I'm sorry, real quick before that, that last que uh, next question or last question. I kind of just want, it, I feel compelled to mention that uh, in, in music and especially in the history of like, American black music, which is really like this uh, real microcosm for what we're talking about in the paradigms between like, you know, Western and, and African philosophy. A lot of it happens in American music. And, you know, there's a, there's a language for it. I mean, swing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and swing, what swing describes, you know, if you don't mean a thing, if it ain't got that swing in jazz, and uh, it's the same swing that was in a lot of Dilla's beats. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's the tension between the grid and, and the natural rhythm, you know, because it, it, it's not that it's supposed to be completely one or completely the other. Yeah. It's the, the tension between. And sometimes it's just like, okay, if you got a kick, you know, on every four beats, you know, maybe the third one is off a little bit. And that's just enough to make, you know, to keep you engaged in it, you know, psychologically and rhythmically. Just like, you know, a heartbeat is like not necessarily on a grid. Like, there's a... There's, there's a natural you know, rhythm to things, and, and I guess the, the question is, or the, the journey in architecture is to figure out how to move from the grid in that sense to a, to a swing. Yeah, uh, hi. Previously, the panel was talking about sort of how there are a lot of architects that aren't really sanctioned or accepted by the structure, and we don't really know where those architects are, and in the same way, um, we were talking about sort of how forms and styles, Mies, is part of some sort of canon. And I was interested if anyone could talk about what breaking away from, you know, what we're so accustomed to, breaking away from this education and what new forms and sort of new emotions from architecture are, are supposed to look like. What they're supposed to look like? Or what, what we want them to be. I, I think that's at the core of everything that we're talking about here, right? That, um, that uh, we don't know what it looks like. We don't really have a way of describing what it looks like. Um, we can just, like, we can sing about it, right? <laughs> we can feel about it. We can dance about it, right? But, um, but what it looks like as architecture is something that's, that's completely unknown. And we're just kind of positing, it was like, okay, look at this, maybe it's this, okay, okay, maybe it's that, maybe it's this. I don't think anyone can, can claim, can, can really claim any kind of ex expertise in this realm. No one can say definitively, this is hip hop architecture, this is not hip hop architecture. It has to be this thing that we kind of just feel, like we just see it and we know it, it's like, oh yeah, 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 that's it. That we feel it, right? Um, I, I don't know if there's any other way to, to describe what that is, what that might be. It's upstairs. It's, up, it, it's definitely, yeah, like you go through that and I feel, I'm like, wow, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is something. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm loving like every little piece of that. <laughs> I took a picture of all like the little oils, like the oil of, uh, the oil of money, like mad money and uh, the spray. <laughs> Oprah's money. Oprah's money. Oh man. Yeah, that, that, that was just like, wow, that's the best. And the rugs, the... the, the I mean, part the of what up. seems to be essential and is very represented in, in the work upstairs and I think is essential to how hip hop came to be. It was a repurposing of things that was around. But in that case, it was by necessity. Um, you know, when there were no longer like programs in public school to train people how to do music and people still wanted to express in that manner, they had to use what was around, you know? And I think like that spirit of repurposing is probably gonna be infused in 
any sort of hip hop anything. So I imagine that, you know, if it's materials, if it's referencing other structures, if it's actual items that are being brought in, I feel like that's gonna be part of the spirit of, of hip hop architecture for sure. Absolutely. All right, with that, I wanna thank our panel once again. Thank you all for coming out.